Good afternoon. Um, yes, the American newspaper industry, as, as David uh, alluded to earlier, the American newspaper industry is certainly in crisis. Every newspaper newsroom is haunted by the empty desks of staffers that we've laid off or bought out over the past three years. We have fewer pages, fewer resources. But we ink stained wretches are a stubborn and feisty lot. Those who write our premature obituaries do so at their own peril. We're fighting for survival not because only not only because we love what we do, but we believe that what what we do, what we think of as newspaper journalism, thorough, facts based, vetted, enterprising, ethical journalism that knows no fear or favor, whose primary objective is to shine the light on dark corners where powerful people and institutions like to hide things, that that kind of journalism is essential to our democracy. We're not too hung up on the mode of delivery. Newspaper journalism can be ink on newsprint, it can be electrons on a computer screen, or on an iPhone. In fact, um, and many people are surprised to hear this, in 24 of the top 25 markets in America, the top trafficked local news website is the daily newspaper. We really don't have an audience problem, but we have a very significant revenue problem. Our profits, if we have any at all, have shrunk at an astounding pace. At most newspapers, the decline in advertising revenues is in the range of about 40 percent. So we as newspaper editors find ourselves in this agonizing quandary. On one hand are these economic realities with which we must contend. On the other is the recognition that we must preserve that one thing we do that's both our greatest expense and our greatest value to the public, the thing for which people continue um, to come to us for and depend on us for. My own method of dealing with that in that quandary in Seattle has been to measure each potential journalistic undertaking by one simple question. What good does it do? If a story is going to take many months and many dollars to report and to publish, what are the chances that it will have a positive impact? Will it make a difference? Will it change the world? By that measure, I would have been so very proud to have published the article that won this year's Grantham Prize for Excellence in Reporting on the Environment. And I am indeed proud to present the prize on behalf of the Grantham Foundation, the Metcalf Institute, and my fellow jurors. The winner is The Smokestack Effect, Toxic Air in America's Schools by Blake Morrison and Brad Heath of USA Today. This is a truly remarkable piece of journalism, one that marries the values of traditional investigative journalism all of those values that I spoke of earlier, uh, what we think of as newspaper journalism, and the promise of the technological tools of this century. Like most good investigations, this one began with a simple question. How is industrial pollution affecting school children? Blake, Brad, and their editors were struck that this was a question no one appeared to have asked, and certainly not to have answered. They began by compiling tens of millions of records from more than two dozen sources to create one of the most extensive online databases any newspaper had ever constructed. That database melded government data on more than 20,000 industrial polluters with the locations of some 128,000 public, private, and parochial schools. Although the Environmental Protection Agency has a special office for children's health, it had never even attempted to answer this question. USA Today used the EPA's own models to address it. Blake and Brad teamed up with researchers from the University of Massachusetts, John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, and the University of Maryland to explore the issues of toxic exposures. Using EPA models, they found thousands of instances where the air outside schools appeared to be at least twice as toxic as the air in nearby neighborhoods. In some cases, that air was 10 times worse. Remarkably, their newspaper then dispatched 30 reporters to monitor the air at 95 schools in 30 states. Blake and Brad followed up on that data analysis with hundreds of interviews that educated them and enabled them to educate their readers. The result was a series complete with a riveting online presentation that Senator Barbara Boxer, who chaired the Environment and Public Works Committee, called, quote, a shocking story of child neglect. 
But as shocking as some of the findings were, the real strength of this project, the aspect that we Grantham jurors found most impressive, was the intelligence, depth, and reserve of this project. Unlike so much of what passes as an investigative journalism these days, particularly in the environmental realm, they did not overstate their case. They went to great lengths to caution against conclusions about causation of cancer and other diseases, and they explained how environmental forensics works. So back to that question, what good did it do? In this case, the story did plenty. It prompted the EPA to launch a $2.25 million program to monitor the air outside 63 schools in 22 states. This was the first time the agency had undertaken such an effort. And as USA reported just last week, that study has already found outside 15 schools in eight states elevated levels of a substance that was used in chemical weapons during World War I. The head of EPA's Children's Health Protection Office was replaced. Concerned citizens who had responded to the story sent more than 8,000 letters to their members of Congress. When she launched this new monitoring program, EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson directly cited the USA Today series, saying, USA Today did what investigative journalists do, which is to find a problem that needs answers. We salute these two reporters and their editors for this extraordinary work because it, it represents an extraordinary commitment of resources at the most difficult time. It is my honor to present the 2009 Grantham Prize for Excellence in Reporting on the Environment to Blake Morrison and Brad Heath of USA Today. That's a very heavy prize. <laughs> very nice. Thank you. We're going to try to tag team this, so wish us luck. And uh, we're as good a PowerPoint as everybody else was, I think. <laughs> Something's supposed to swoop in about now. There it is. Very good. First, thanks uh, to David and to the rest of the jurors and to the Metcalf Institute for the seminar and the prize and to the Grantham family. Uh, this is an incredibly special time for us. And uh, we can't thank you enough for honoring us. Uh, a lot of people here deserve praise. And so let me start with the people at USA Today. Uh, Ken Paulson, who I think mentioned earlier, we ran him out of the building. Uh, Ken was extremely supportive. And the first time we talked about this idea with him said, uh, this is a great idea, and championed it uh, from the start. He also is the person who came up with the name the smokestack effect. And uh, I think that uh, had it not been for Ken and his resolve, this would have been uh, almost impossible for us to do. Uh, Kinsey Wilson and John Hillkirk, at that time John was the uh, executive editor, he has now taken over for Ken, uh, also made this possible, uh, giving us the encouragement and resources we needed to make sure that we uh, could do all we set out to do. Uh, and Linda Matthews, Linda, could you please stand for a moment? Linda is the uh, editor who oversaw and coordinated all of this. She worked tirelessly on it. I actually wanted you to stand for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time I can actually tell her what to do. Uh, she went out and did monitoring herself and participated in this with us uh, and uh, really helped make this work uh, to the extent that we had hoped. Uh, we also had partners outside of the newspaper at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, we had uh, two people that we worked with there, Jim Boyce and Michael Ash, who helped us coordinate uh, all sorts of data that Brad will talk about later. And also from Johns Hopkins, uh, Pat Bricey, who couldn't be here tonight, and Amir Subkata from the University of Maryland, who taught us all sorts of things about how to monitor for chemicals that we didn't know existed uh, just a few weeks before we were taught how to monitor for them. Uh, most important, I think Brad and I want to thank our wives, Brad's wife Jamie and my wife Bernie, who are here. Um, I know that uh, we spent a lot of time away from them during the time we were doing this, and uh, I know from Bernie's perspective, I think she's secretly happy that I wasn't there to hound her for watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians. So I'm back, and uh, you're not watching that anymore. <clears throat> so today we want to explain to you a little bit about how we came up with this idea, where we took it, and uh, what we found, what sort of results uh, have come. And you're going to see two videos uh, that were shot by uh, Garrett Hubbard, Hubbard and Steve Elfers uh, that do, I think, an extraordinary job of telling this story. 
So I'm going to transfer over to slide two here, the dangers. Part of the reason we wanted to look at this is because children are uniquely susceptible. They are vulnerable in a way that adults aren't. They take in more air per pound than adults do. And because they're still young and developing, their organs are affected in ways that ours aren't. That means that whatever they breathe, the effects of that are magnified considerably. Some people say as much as 10 times. Now, EPA had data on this. They had a model that was designed to track industrial pollutants and to try to figure out where they go. Yet, for some reason, EPA had never used its data this way. And as a consequence, we had absolutely no idea what was, what was out there. The other reason we didn't have any idea is because there are no laws that compel the government to do this. In fact, the only laws that compel the government to do any kind of ambient air monitoring go to the components of smog. And that leaves about 180 other chemicals that are classified as hazardous that we don't know anything about. We have no idea where they are, how much of them are there. So our approach, it was pretty simple. Our first step was to basically try to identify schools where further investigation was warranted. Now, we chose those schools for a simple reason, and we chose schools conceptually for a simple reason. They were places where children were required to gather. It wasn't just that you lived in a bad part of town. We had to send our kids there. We were given no choice. So the idea was, what's in the air outside of those schools? So that's when Brad and I began gathering the information that we would need to move forward. The very first thing we gathered when we set out to, to complete this project was an EPA model known as Risk Screening Environmental Indicators. And we were very grateful to have help in that from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst um, and, uh, and some of the researchers there who had spent considerable time and, as it turns out, money uh, obtaining from the EPA a set of those data that go beyond what the agency regularly hands out. Uh, the next step was to build a list of the nation's schools, which is harder than you might think. Um, we, we got a lot from the U.S. Education Department, but we also stitched together our own list uh, dealing with 24, I think, state education agencies and came up with 127,800 schools, I believe, at the end of the day, private, public, and parochial around the country. Uh, from there, we were able to overlay the schools onto this model to look at the effect industrial pollution was having. This is a model that tells you how chemicals travel through the air when they leave a smokestack and where they're likely to land and in what concentration. And we wanted to be very careful in this process. The, the model tells you lots of things that you can draw lots of conclusions from, and only some of them will be valid. And we worked very carefully in this process with academic researchers, public health experts, and frankly, even people at the EPA to understand the limits of what we had. And what we had was a very valuable ranking tool. So what we did with that tool was to look at uh, how many schools around the country indicated worse exposure to toxic chemicals than a school that was closed down in 2005 after state regulators in Ohio determined that the risk of contracting cancer there was 50 times higher than they determined was acceptable. Um, and with that, we'll show you the first video of what we found. exactly what they do down there like I never really realized like it can be like that harmful I just like there's pollution everywhere I say that it smells like perm solution sometimes I smell like a sweeter type bitter type smell we wanted to take a look at the impact of industrial pollution on schools around the country. Kids are particularly susceptible to the impact of industrial pollution, and very little is known about how toxic chemicals might affect their health. So we took EPA data and a government model, and we overlaid the locations of about 128,000 schools. It's a task that the government has never tried to do. What we found were high levels of dangerous chemicals that appeared outside a lot of schools around the country. Now, it's only a model, but the model does tell us where toxic hotspots are and which schools might be there. 
Meredith Hitchens Elementary School is located along the Ohio River in a town uh, outside Cincinnati called Addiston, Ohio. And in 2005, the Ohio EPA was called in and, and asked to do some monitoring on the roof of the school. What they found were very high levels of toxic chemicals, so high that they said the risk of cancer there was about 50 times above what the state considered acceptable. This was a, it was a good place to be for those kids. It had to be 70 years ago when I started. And I went from first grade to the eighth grade here. We had a facility directly across from the school where we're sitting that had a variety of upsets and accidents in a year, 2004. When we found these high concentrations, we found they yielded unacceptable results compared to the health-based standards that the Ohio EPA uses. As a consequence, the district decided to act fast. They got the kids out of the school, closed the school down. That was a pipe foundry years ago before it became a chemical company. But that's all over and done with. <laughs> we now know that a lot of diseases are triggered by early exposures, but it takes years, even decades, for those diseases to progress from the early exposure to the actual manifestation of a disease like cancer. The Ohio Department of Health confirm that there were additional cancers in this neighborhood. It was uh, taken very seriously and very upsetting. Matt Becker is a teenager who lives about two miles from the plastics plant that's across the street from Meredith Hitchens Elementary. He was diagnosed with cancer a couple of years ago, and his parents wonder, could that have been caused by the chemicals that were being emitted by that plant? The doctors came in, they pulled chairs in. You're wondering why all this fuss? Why are they pulling all these chairs in? Where are all these people coming from and why? Instead of using the word tumor, they use the word mass. So of course my mind goes to tumor, goes to cancer. I just immediately started crying. My mom started crying right there. My dad just put his head down. And then they said, um, non-Hoskins lymphoma. I had a tumor that was about eight inches by six inches, like this. Right, right there in the center of my chest, behind my chest bone. I was sitting there in my bed while they were talking, like holding it in, trying not to cry. And they just, the tears just came out when everybody left. And I told my grandma that, you know, like I don't want to die. I thank God every day that he's in remission. With the economy today, we can't move. Our house won't sell. We won't have anywhere to go. On a human level, you gotta say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really feel for you as a parent. I'm a parent. Uh, a sick child is probably the worst nightmare for, for any parent. I, I think not knowing what the cause is is probably the worst part about it. I, I don't know what the cause of it is either. The plant's changed hands since the Ohio EPA started monitoring there, and the former owner said that its pollution never posed any serious health risks. The new owner says they're committed to doing even better. We are committed to making sure that, that we are not a cause of any type of issue like this going forward. Uh, we're working continually to try to improve our performance. Uh, we, we show improving trends in all of, our, all of our emission controls since we've taken over ownership, and I think that's what, what you look for, is you look for improvement all the time. Immediately after our legal orders Against this facility, the air became cleaner and since then has had some improvements in air quality. We're still working to secure the long term a guarantee of air quality in the area. Part of the reason we wanted to use the EPA model is because it creates a ranking system that compares one site to another. It's also part of the reason we wanted to look at Meredith Hitchens. We knew from the seven months of monitoring that the Ohio EPA did what was in the air outside that school. And we know from the model that when we rank that school against others, we get an accurate representation of those that are worse and those that are likely better. And what we ended up finding were about 435 schools where the air outside appeared to actually be worse than the school in Ohio that was shut down.
the model and the, the database we built did two things for us. Uh, first, and I think most important, it allowed us to put a great deal of information in front of parents around the country. So for example, anybody can now use our database online to look up a school near them and see what's likely to be in the air and to see what the, what the issues associated with that might be. Uh, it also allowed us to draw some conclusions. For example, one thing people asked was, why focus on schools? Wouldn't this be a community issue? That's true, but we were also able to identify thousands of schools where the air around the schools is likely to be much worse than other places in the school district. Um, we also weren't content to stop with it's really frustrating um, to stop with just this modeling. A model tells you only what's probable. So we partnered with the, uh, Pat Bricey from Johns Hopkins University and Amir Sipkata from uh, the University of Maryland, who designed a testing regimen for us, secured the equipment for us, and really held our hands through a monitoring process at more than 90 schools in more than 30 states. Uh, and they took our results and they told us what we had found. Um, all we had to do was, was collect the samples uh, and, and we were able to draw a great deal on the, their expertise. One of the schools we visited was Midland, Pennsylvania. There's a video to go with that as well. Every town, every has, town it. has it. It's, uh, it's bad, uh, spots, bad spots, but, but you know, you know, that's it's everywhere in the USA. USA. Midland is Midland a town is about, about 3,000 3, people, people along the Ohio River, 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 and it's long and it's been known, known as a steel, as a steel town. town. Part of the reason we decided to go there to was go there. that it was ranking pretty high among the schools that we modeled. The approach used by USA Today was to take the modeling data and rank schools across the country in terms of what their health risk might be. Part of the reason we decided to go out and do snapshot monitoring of air at some of these schools was because the government wasn't. There has to be a thorough investigation beyond just the modeling approach. We worked with Johns Hopkins University and the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland to come up with a way of gathering data from schools uh, around the country. One of the things we did was to do as we call snapshot monitoring, where we might spend five days outside of school with various apparatus, collecting samples of the air, then sending those samples to the lab to be analyzed. But once we got the samples, the samples were collected on pieces of filter paper. So first we had to digest the filter paper. Then we had to dissolve the metals in concentrated acid. Once we had the metals that were dissolved in this concentrated acid solution, we could inject them into the ICPMS, that's a fancy piece of analytical equipment, that tells us how much metals are present. I've lived in Midland for the last four or five years, but I grew up in the industry the next town down. Uh, I, I don't really have any concerns about uh, the pollution. Midland and a host of other towns, it's not surprising that residents might not see problems or might think that this isn't related to industries in the areas. Part of what's so insidious about air pollution is that the problems that show up might not come for decades later. One of the things I worry about as a pediatrician is that children are much more vulnerable, much more susceptible to toxic chemicals than adults. They may be breathing things early on in their lives that don't manifest until 20, 30 years later. The cancer rate's high. I've lost uh, a couple handfuls of people from cancer. You always have a concern about, you know, what may be coming from, coming from that. The Midland, Pennsylvania school, the air monitoring suggests there might be some concern there. The child may seem to be okay. The child may be able to go to school, uh, may be able to study, may be able to play sports, looks okay, but is actually going to be operating with less than his given potential. There is pollutants, let's just say that much. I don't believe there's anything in there. If they're, they're hiding it, they're, they're doing a real, real good job of hiding it. The air monitoring indicated that we had high levels of airborne chromium there. Certain species of chromium are highly carcinogenic. The airborne chromium was consistent with the types of industries that we think are close. It's an industrial corridor with a steel mill, a power plant, a foundry close by. And the chromium measurements suggested that there's more follow-up that needs to be done to think about what that risk might be. 
how do you know that a child is, is being exposed? And the answer to that question is, in many cases, you don't know. Because if the exposures are at relatively low levels, they may be causing damage in the child. They may be causing mutations in a child's cells that begin the pathway to cancer. If I found out it was, you know, if there was something dangerous going on there, I, I would definitely uh, have to relocate my family. If it is something going on, I would really want them to look into it. So no parent should take these results and think that their, their, their children are at, are at risk and they need to kind of stop sending their kids to school. If a family realizes through reading your story or other reports that they live in a polluted area, they should bring this matter to the attention of their pediatrician, their family doctor, so that the doctor is also aware of it. And then the doctor may want to do appropriate tests. Experts who have looked at what we did say that parents shouldn't be alarmed, but they should be concerned. They should start asking questions, both of their school district and of the companies that are located nearby. They should try to find out what's in the air. And the experts say that they can contact advocacy groups, they can contact state environmental agencies, they can contact their school officials, that these are questions that they ought to ask and answers they should get. We've heard from hundreds of parents, people who are like Mary Pavetto in Portland, Oregon, who has found herself in charge of an ad hoc group of parents. They've collected 1,200 signatures to get a local factory to use the best air filtration technology as they're trying to get the EPA there to do monitoring. Uh, David, in his introduction, mentioned that the EPA has launched a $2.25 million program. And last week, they reported on 15 schools in uh, about eight different states where they find, found high levels of a substance called acrolein. Uh, now, acrolein uh, used to be used as a chemical weapon in World War I. Uh, it now comes from burning things. And at these locations, it wasn't just that they found a little bit more. At every location, they found at least 100 times above what the government considers safe. I spoke with a principal at Spain Elementary in Detroit. And he had been there for 13 years, but this was the first time he had ever heard that the air outside his school was bad. And he had been sending asthmatic kids across the street to the Children's Hospital of Michigan over the course of his time there. Uh, but he said uh, not until this monitoring started did he have any idea why. Uh, what we found with this was that the results uh, from the EPA have been uh, startlingly sound. Uh, but what we're getting from state regulators is quite a bit different. In Pennsylvania, for instance, the superintendent of the school district you saw in Midland requested immediately that the state put a monitor on the roof. Now, we were there, and during the time we were there, the steel mill in the borough was operating, and we found chromium. During the 12 days that the state was monitoring there, the steel mill was idle, and they found no chromium. And they've stopped monitoring. Louisiana, one can argue, is even more pronounced. There is a school called Wyandotte Early Childhood Center, which is six blocks from the nation's second largest refinery. That's where four-year-olds go, 120 of them. That school uh, was, uh, basically came up pretty high on our modeled list. And when the state went there to monitor, they were there for one day, for four hours, and took one air sample before declaring <clears throat> that the air outside the school met all known health and safety uh, uh, standards. Now, if that's enough, then uh, I guess we did 24 times more than what the state of Louisiana did, and we weren't even satisfied that ours was more than illustrative. So the message to parents going forward is use the tools that this database provides to ask questions. Be vigilant. We care a lot about things like where our kids go to school relative to sex offenders or relative to drugs. We take a look through their bags of Halloween candy when they come home. But yet we don't ask the kinds of questions like what's in the air outside their schools and what can we do about it? And those are the kinds of questions that we hope parents will continue to ask. Thanks.